Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're joined by Dr. Kirk Knowlton, the Director of Cardiovascular Research and the Chair of Cardiovascular Department here at Intermountain Medical Center to talk a little bit about a study that was recently reviewed from the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Card Cardiology. We're going to discuss his findings on this report and the study and kind of get his perspective. Kirk, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Amanda, and thanks for uh, given us the opportunity to talk about this important topic related to heart disease and COVID-19, a surprising correlation in some ways. So I want to start with what you do in particular. Will you explain a little bit about your role at Intermountain Medical Center and how you got involved with this study to begin with as well? Right. So <clears throat> I'm a, a clinical cardiologist at Intermountain Medical Center um, and love and enjoy taking care of patients that I'm able to see, but I also have the opportunity to participate in research. And um, before I came to Intermountain Medical Center, I worked in, at, uh, in San Diego, California, studying viruses that cause heart disease. Um, and so when, uh, when uh, COVID-19 came along, uh, there were a lot of interesting questions about whether uh, COVID-19 would also cause heart disease. And so, um, so I took the opportunity and was invited by the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology to review the current status and thought processes that uh, exist in relation to heart disease and uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And, um, and so I reviewed the literature related to that and talked a little bit about the mechanisms that the virus replicates, the life cycle of the virus, because I think that's very important in thinking about how it could cause heart disease. And then we looked at some of the evidence in, in a, a large number of papers that are coming out now that talk about the acute early effects during the acute illness of the virus. And then also new things coming out about later, even after people have recovered from the virus that affects their heart. In this recent study too, like you mentioned, we started to hear about these long-term effects of COVID-19 and one of those was damage to the heart, which could either be caused by the virus itself, inflammation triggered by the immune system uh, in response to the virus or an increased clotting in our heart vessels. Can you break down those three different things a little bit more for us? If I was a patient experiencing this, what do those three things mean to me? Yeah, sure, Amanda. Well, I think probably one of the important things to think about when we think about heart disease that's caused by COVID, SARS-CoV-2 or the syndrome of COVID-19 is, um, is the fact that, uh, first of all, it, when people are in the hospital, it was even identified as early as Wuhan, China, that when, the, when people were in the hospital with COVID-19, and there was evidence of heart damage, either by ultrasound echocardiogram showing abnormal function of the heart or release of enzymes that we, or uh, markers in the heart, proteins from the heart that we typically follow for heart attacks or things like that. Um, when, when there was evidence of heart disease and it happened a moderate amount, about 20 to 30% of time, in people who were hospitalized with their lung disease for COVID-19. When, when they had heart disease, their prognosis was much worse. Uh, they had a, a many fold higher rate of being intubated or even of dying from COVID-19 if they had heart disease. Whereas if they didn't have evidence of heart disease, they had a much better chance of recovery and surviving the disease. So I think that's the first kind of thing to think about in a time course here is that, gee, the virus, the inflammation, clotting, something is causing heart damage even during the acute illness. And then we'll talk a little bit later about what happens after people recover. But um, so what people have been discovering, and it's taken a, a moderate amount of time given the COVID pandemic timeframe to, uh, to learn more about this, partly because I think people have not been anxious to necessarily perform sophisticated studies or even autopsies on people who are infected, partly because of the risks of infection to other individuals. But initially they found evidence of inflammation in the heart, which we sometimes call myocarditis. 
subsequent studies say that may not be as severe or as often, but then they started to observe that um, people would have clots in their lungs uh, known as pulmonary embolism. Uh, and uh, while those can happen to other people, they tend to occur much more commonly in people with COVID-19. A few people even had clots in their legs, in their arteries and their veins. And it caused people to wonder if maybe some of the damage in the heart could be related to clotting in some of the arteries in the heart as well. And uh, so some of the autopsies that have been done have demonstrated that there is some increase in clotting that occurs there. So, so uh, the virus can infect the heart itself and it can also stimulate clotting, which may be from infection of endothelial cells, the covering of the arteries and the veins, or it may just be inflammation, which is the other thing we have to deal with with COVID-19. It is a strong activator of the immune system. And when there's generalized global, um, generalized global inflammation in what they call a cytokine storm, cytokines being inflammatory molecules, when there's a storm of those, a lot of other organs get affected by it, including the clotting system, perhaps the heart, the lung, et cetera, and other organs. So those are some of the way. And then there's just the stress of having COVID-19. So if there's some underlying heart disease that already exists, that stress and that illness that goes with COVID-19 uh, and, and a syndrome and the SARS-CoV-2 infection can also be associated with uh, some damage to the heart and other organs. In that study you reviewed as well, it said that one in five people that came into the hospital had some sort of heart damage. How yeah. did we start to learn about that heart damage? And what about those people that never came into the hospital? Is there a way for us to learn if they've been impacted with heart damage at all? Or how do we collect data from that sample of people if we don't have access to them? Right, that, those are great questions, Amanda. So um, the first thing I think they noticed is um, some people had abnormalities on their electrocardiograms that just measure the electrical activity of the heart. That sometimes is abnormal when a person has a heart attack and uh, is the first screening tool for a heart attack. And so some people had abnormalities there. <clears throat> so then they look for proteins released into the blood uh, biomarkers like troponin. Some of the people may have heard of that when they were in the hospital. Troponin is elevated when the muscle of the heart is damaged and it releases this protein. And so they found, wow, it's elevated in a significant percentage of the patients. And then they started to image them and to, to do studies with ultrasound echocardiograms and, um, and occasionally cardiac magnetic resonance imaging or cardiac MR. And um, that's a really good test for studying inflammation in the heart. It's a little bit sophisticated and not all places do it as well as other places do, but, um, but that's a marker that, that allows kind of to see whether there's inflammation in that heart tissue. So, and then ultimately people who were unsuccessful, at, you know, didn't survive, they were able to actually look at their heart tissue itself and see what was present. And they found that there was virus in the heart in a substantial percentage of the patients that had died uh, from, um, from COVID-19. Uh, if they found virus in the lung, they often found it in the heart also. And so that implied that maybe the virus is playing a role in this in some way uh, as well, not just a nonspecific reaction. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question I think is, is even more challenging. How do we know what happens to someone who wasn't in the hospital? And um, which is the majority by far, right? By far the most, most people go home and recover from their um, COVID-19 at home. And so how could we know whether they were, are having or have had heart damage? And um, I think we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg of that population because they don't have access to all those tests. They're just at home trying to get better from this disease process. So um, we're seeing some patients now who come in after they've had COVID-19 and they may be having palpitations, irregular heartbeats, 
but they just don't feel as well. They're just having, they're struggling to recover from their COVID-19. Their exercise capacity is not as good. And uh, maybe their electrocardiograms, if they get one, is not perfectly normal. And there may be signs of inflammation in the covering of the heart called pericarditis. So now people are starting to wonder, well, what happens if we image those people? Could we see retrospectively whether they have damage? And the answer is yes. And we can talk a little bit more about that, that there is some even retrospectively. That, that sounds slightly promising that we are able to kind of go back and figure out if uh, what they're experiencing now relates to that. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about something that's been in the news a lot, and it's college football or sports in general. Uh, the Pac-12 recently made a decision to postpone or cancel their fall season, and they cited one of those reasons um, as myocarditis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but they cited that as a reason for canceling the season um, because athletes could potentially get that. Will you talk a little bit about, first of all, what that is and how the research you looked up relates to this specifically? Right. So myocarditis is simply uh, inflammation, the, dita, the, the itis part of the word of the myocardium. So myocarditis, usually there's a lot of <clears throat> um, lymphocytes in the myocardium when that occurs, but sometimes it could just be uh, mild inflammation that's occurring that's a little bit harder to diagnose. And um, But they did cite, the Pac-12, as you mentioned, cited that there had been college football players who had been diagnosed with myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, uh, associated with their uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 infection process. And the concern that that may have long-term implications for the performance of these athletes and their lifestyle after that caused them to say, you know, we really don't know. There's some people who are being diagnosed with this um, and we hate to, you know, th their thought process, I assume, was that they hate to put the athletes at risk uh, with um, SARS-CoV-2 and potential long-term effects, even though most people recover from their lung disease and most people don't have really, really bad heart disease. You know, do we want to subject a few of our best athletes in the in the world or the United States to that risk? And so um, they cited that as a, a potential complication and that they didn't want to have that risk for their players. So recently, about the science, same time that announcement came out, there was a paper published just at the end of July um, in the, the journal JAMA or Journal of American Medical Association Cardiology, uh, JAMA Cardiology. And, and it was a group of people. I, I think it's a very interesting study. We need to learn more about it. I'll tell you what the study showed. But, um, but basically they took people of all ages greater than 18, anyone greater than 18 who had been diagnosed with COVID-19 by PCR, the test we normally use to diagnose COVID-19. And those individuals had recovered, about a third had been hospitalized, about a half recovered at home, and some were actually asymptomatic. They didn't know they had COVID-19. And two weeks after they were, and when they were proven that their PCR was negative, they were COVID-19 negative, so they didn't have active inflammation. They did this cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, cardiac MR to look at their heart and see if there was evidence of damage or inflammation. They also measured troponin, which was lower than we typically find in the hospital, but a lot of people had a little bit of troponin elevation, but they also found evidence of structural damage to the heart and inflammation in over half of the patients. Uh, I, I almost, you know, that's, that's a very high number and we need to, we need to learn more about that, and that needs to be repeated. Um, I, I'd hate to think that everyone, that half of everyone that has COVID-19 is going to end up with some myocardial damage. In the long run, we don't know a year from now what that will look like, whether they'll perfectly recover or not, but I think it adds a new dimension to this concept of COVID-19. We're seeing a much greater, a much 
a, a, an increase in the number of young people who are being affected, infected by SARS-CoV-2 and getting COVID-19, thinking, a lot of them thinking, well, you know, the chance of me dying from this as a young person is very, very low. And uh, the chance that I need to be hospitalized is low. So, you know, I'm going to, you know, what I just have to live my life. Maybe there's another parameter that we have to think about. And that is related to, could there be long-term effects in other organs? Obviously we worry a lot about the heart because it's such a crucial organ. Um, other organs may also be affected and we don't know truly even the long-term effects on the lung. So I think it causes, gives us cause for pause uh, to think about the importance of preventing the disease, which is you know, mask wearing, washing our hands, um, social distancing, uh, I'm not wearing a mask now because I'm in my office alone, uh, but, um, but normally I, I wear it whenever I'm in public in the hospital and other places. Those are, those are the best ways to prevent this potential risk in the future. You mentioned that we don't know enough yet too about whether this damage could be long-term. When do you think that will be able to indicate if someone who experiences heart damage that it is something that could affect them long term. Is it going to take a couple months, a couple years? Is it something that we're going to be consistently studying? How do how do we know uh, if you contract COVID that this damage is going to stay with us? Is is that even a possibility to know that? I think it is possible. Um, we will know in the long run. We will know how often this happens. Where the the pandemic in the United States began in March, um, earlier in other places and. Um, and the, the Chinese may start looking at this as well. Uh, in Europe, it was earlier than it was here, such as in Italy and, and, and Germany and so forth, um, than it was in the United States. So it takes, if we wanna see what the effect is at six months, uh, we're probably going to take people who were infected in about April. And so that would be, you know, what, October or so, we'd want to be looking at them uh, with cardiac MR. and. Hopefully there will be funding from institutions like the National Institute of Health and others who will uh, fund a relatively expensive test like cardiac MR uh, to determine, that's the most sensitive way to determine where there's, whether there's damage and inflammation and look back and see how they're doing. But we also just, we need to be asking them how they're doing. Uh, and are, are you, have you been able to return to your activity levels before you had COVID-19? Are you experiencing palpitations, irregular heartbeats? Are you experiencing dizziness? Do you have fainting spells that might occur from arrhythmias that could be secondary to the inflammation? So I think we would probably want to combine symptoms uh, with these more sophisticated imaging strategies. Uh, and, and maybe we even include other things, other imaging strategy, strategies like PET scans that can are very sensitive for uh, inflammation and so on. So I think it will be possible at six months and 12 months, let's say, I'd be interested in the results of both of those studies. Um, and then maybe uh, maybe in, in the long term, we'll be looking at 10 years, you know, what happened to these people. But, but by then, hopefully it's a, a thing of the distant past. So it sounds like too, if you did experience any sort of heart damage, if you had COVID-19, you should really work closely with your medical provider and make sure that you're going in and getting those regular checkups every year to figure out if you do have any sort of long-term effects. Because if you don't do that, there's really no way to figure that out. And that kind of brings me to this question. Someone just asked, uh, so New York's Mount Sinai Hospital created a post-COVID clinic. Um, if, if this affects potentially such a large proportion of cases, is a clinic like this possible in the future for Utah? Is it even a good idea to set up something like this? What are your thoughts on that? that I think that's a very intriguing possibility. And um, I, I have seen patients who um, have uh, struggled with cardiac symptoms after they've had COVID-19, young people. And um, I think that is a very real possibility. It will probably depend on, um, you know, we kind of hope we don't need it. We hope that the, the, the pandemic will subside somewhat as it's doing now. We're very enthusiastic about that. But I think that's a very real possibility. And, uh, and it would provide opportunities to study it and perhaps study ways to treat it 
and evaluate heart disease, lung disease, other diseases that people are recovering from. I think it's a, I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. I wanna talk a little bit more about sports, uh, specifically high school and younger aged kids with, with colleges making these decisions to postpone sports season. Why aren't high schools making these decisions or even younger kids? Is there not as big of a worry for someone who's under the age of 18 for heart damage or we just don't know enough yet? I think we could start with we don't know enough yet. Um, I think, you know, the, the people that are making these very important decisions are, are thoughtful. They're, they're careful. Um, and there will always be differences of opinion as to what the right thing to do is. There probably isn't a right thing. There, there are consequences to having sports. There are consequences to not having sports, um, as we all know. And so I think that... Um, I think, you know, there there are risks. Um, you know, how prevalent is it in the community? Uh, if people start getting infected while playing sports, how quickly do we stop them from proceeding and playing? How well can the teams protect their players and their athletes um, from getting the disease? I, I've heard that there are some teams that say if one of the team players gets the gets COVID. They're, everybody's off for two weeks. Nothing will happen for two weeks, et cetera. Um, we have to worry about the fans also. I don't think most high schools can afford to put LCD screens in the stands so that the fans can watch like the Jazz are doing, but, um, uh, or like other uh, teams are doing in the NBA bubble. But, um, but you know, we have to worry about the, the, the fans and the, the dense, um, population that would come to see a football and cheer football game and cheer and yell and scream for their their uh, child and um, and so forth so we're right to worry about it uh, but um, the exact answer is is difficult to know for sure and I yeah it's difficult to know for sure I think we'll need to watch how this plays out a little bit as time goes on we're just starting this uh, you know, Tennessee was one of the first places to start uh, high school sports. And so far, no, uh, maybe it's a little early, but no major adverse uh, increase in the number of uh, patients diagnosed, et cetera. And do we know anything about children, someone who's in elementary school, not related to sports specifically, but related to heart damage? Is there any indication that someone that young could potentially have heart damage um, in a severe case of COVID, it, do we have any sort of cases coming out like that yet? Unfortunately, yes, we do. Um, it's not common. It's not common. As, as everyone on this call would know, um, children tend not to get as sick or sick. Uh, the, in many cases, the big concern is taking it home to parents and grandparents, right? But um, there is a syndrome that's specifically been identified in children. And it's called a multi-organ inflammatory syndrome, multi-organ inflammatory syndrome in children. So they've labeled it MIS-C. And this, um, uh, you know, it's similar to a disease that, or has characteristics similar to a disease that's been previously described called Kawasaki disease. Um, but someone looked at whether there was evidence of myocarditis in these children who had MIS-C and a very high percentage of them had myocarditis. Now, that's not to say a high percentage of children who get infected with SARS-CoV-2 actually will get myocarditis. The percentages are still very small, but we, it, it's not zero. It's not zero. And, uh, and, and so we do have to, I, I think we want to be cautious with our children, uh, not only for the sake of their parents and grandparents that they take it home to, but also uh, for themselves. I think we just don't really know the long-term consequences of this in children. I wanna switch gears a little bit. Um, in a recent press release, you said that the link between heart diseases and transmittable viruses isn't something new. Autopsies of patients who died in the 1918 flu pandemic found heart damage, and 50% of the patients who died of polio uh, from 1942 to 1951 had heart damage as well. Knowing this, is there anything we can learn or should be learning from past viruses on how to help treat these people who develop heart damage from COVID-19? 
Yeah, um, the great, great question. That's no, a surprising finding. And I actually uh, came across some of those references as I was reviewing to write this article about uh, heart damage with SARS-CoV-2. And I knew that influenza virus can cause heart damage. I've seen some tragic cases, not in 1918 or 19, but uh, in more recent uh, uh, in more recent influenza infections, like with H1N1, that seem to have a particular predilection for young women uh, of childbearing age, um, and uh, you know it was tragic what what we would see sometimes in that situation. That that's probably one that we've mostly lived through and seen. Um, and, and then I did learn um, for the first time that, you know, I always thought of polio as a paralytic disease that, that uh, preceded most of us as well, um, although we saw people who had had polio virus. But in fact, of those who died, not necessarily the, the major, all of the patients, but of those who died, 50% had heart disease. So I think the take home message is that most viruses, um, can cause, have been implicated in heart disease. The incidence varies, the severity varies, but we, viruses can cause heart disease, temporary or long-term. Uh, it's not all really well-defined because there aren't, we don't have that many studies in all of those, but I think it emphasizes the, um, you know, most valuable things about treatment I think it does help us think about these things a little bit. Uh, number one is prevention is our most sure treatment, right? Prevention of getting ourselves infected or our loved ones infected. That's the main thing we can do right now. But I think it also teaches us a couple of other things. If we look at all of, I think all, if not all, almost all of the current antiviral therapies that are used in clinical practice, like Tamiflu, for example. Tamiflu, which is used um, uh, for, um, for the influenza virus, they're directed against the replication of the virus itself. I think the more we can learn about how we can attack the virus and how it infects cells and how it replicates is a good strategy. So I really like, for example, antibodies that prevent the virus from binding to its receptor in the heart cell or the lung cell or any other cell. And, and that will stop the replication if it can't get into a cell, for example. Or remdesivir, which is the one that's been, that the FDA has authorized for use now, it stops a mechanism of virus replication directly aimed at the virus replication. So I think in the long run, we learned that uh, drugs or, or uh, or therapies aimed at preventing viral replication tend to be some of the most efficacious. Even HIV, for example, which has been linked to heart disease, um, we still don't have a vaccine, but we have very good antiviral agents, very good antiviral agents. And we've done, a, you know, quite the, the, the incidence of that has been, and the effects of that have been significantly reduced with those antiviral agents. I wanna just talk really quickly one more time about the percentage uh, that's being affected by heart damage. Can you just reiterate what percentage of COVID cases that we're seeing are having heart attack or heart uh, damage? And if, if you could guess, what percentage do you feel like could have long-term effects from this in the future as well? I appreciate you introducing the word guess. So I'll, pro I'll probably take advantage of that. But of hospitalized patients, we know the best, right? We know the best of hospitalized patients. And in hospitalized patients, 20 to 30% have evidence of heart damage. Uh, eventually we might find a few more, but it's, it's fair to say it's in that, in that ballpark. Um, uh, people who are not hospitalized, uh, I don't think we know yet, um, uh, th that are not significant, uh, as significantly impaired. Um, before reviewing some of the previous, the, the recent studies, I would have said maybe 10% have evidence of heart damage. But I think we're gonna to have to elevate that estimate in the short term to, to maybe, my guess, using your word, my guess, 30 to 50%. And long-term, I hope it's much less than that. Lo hopefully it's back down into the, uh, you know, even single digit, digit percent, but we don't really even know yet. And people can recover from viruses. That's one thing we've learned. Even heart damage can recover from vi viral infection. 
So let's hope that's the direction this goes as well. Kirk, is there anything else that you wanted to mention to us on this topic or anything the public should be aware of in terms of the connection between COVID-19 and heart disease? I, I think that um, one, recognize that it can occur. Uh, uh, two, we, remember we don't know, it looks like it affects people of all ages. Uh, all ages over 18 is what we really say, but then children can get some too, we know from this MISC. And um, so people can get it. And it's worth reminding our loved ones that there may be more to it than lung disease. And third, um, you know, keep your mask handy. Uh, this may be our best tool at, uh, at preventing heart disease. Well, Kirk, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the time and the opportunity to talk about this subject. For anyone watching who wants more information about COVID-19 and would like to get screened or tested, you can call our COVID-19 hotline at 844-442-5224. We also still have our emotional health relief hotline available seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That phone number is 833-442-2211. If you want any information about heart disease or our heart institute, you can also go to intermountainhealthcare.org and search for information there. We have lots of blog topics on this and content out there for you to inform yourself. Kirk, thank you so much again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Great, thank you very much. It's great to see you all, thank you.